Um, so SnowTrack, uh, current priorities are uh, listed there. Uh, creating coordinating mobility services are, is our number one effort. Educating outreach and engagement around our issues, planning de and design of livable communities, securing public support and funding for uh, transit and transportation. Um, and finally, around emergency response and coordination, especially during COVID of making sure uh, we're dealing things as they come forward. With that, I'd like to introduce Paulo. I'm gonna stop my share so we can see Paulo a little bit more. Um, so Paulo is a nationally respected thought leader um, and doer on transportation issues who lives here in the Northwest in Seattle. Um, Paulo has managed the King County Commute Trip Reduction Program. I think that may have been one of his first jobs uh, within transportation then was the Director of Transportation Sustainability at Seattle Children's Hospital, doing amazing, innovative things uh, for their program. Uh, for a brief time, was Director of Transit and Mobility at the Seattle Department of Transportation, and now leads his own consulting firm, uh, working with college campuses, hospitals, cities, even the World Bank on figuring out ways to improve transportation uh, to be more sustainable and address climate change. One of the things that he does is work with Front Center as their transportation and land use uh, lead. Um, and we're going to obviously hear a lot more about that today. Uh, I first got to know Paulo probably through some transportation campaign in Seattle. Uh, but the, th the first thing that I really got to know Paulo by was actually through the news when he got a little bit in trouble. Um, so he had just moved in to a new house in uh, Wallingford slash Green Lake um, and wanted to have a sandbox for his kids. And uh, so he put it right between the sidewalk and the roadway, kind of the space I imagined that was available. Um, and apparently the city was not too happy uh, about this. For some reason, we could have a, a, a garden box there, but you couldn't have a, uh, a sandbox. And I think it just speaks to uh, the sometimes our, what we establish as norms of what is acceptable um, doesn't fit for the context or for the people, uh, uh, all people. Um, and I, I think that perspective, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of media attention that was gained to that. And uh, I, I don't know actually what the ultimate outcome was, but I'm sure as influenced Paulo's perspective uh, of how he uh, does his work moving forward. Um, Paulo is originally from Brazil, and maybe he'll have some stories from Brazil. Um, but uh, I, I think just kind of the international perspective that he brings, the national perspective that he brings to his work, um, and the work that he does in transportation and climate change has just been amazing. And so I think it's going to be a great pleasure to hear what he has to say and what he's working on. So Paulo, the, uh, the Zoom meeting is yours. Oh, thanks so much. And, and Brock, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, we go back such a long ways that I, I forgot that the whole sandbox story was part of that mix. So the sandbox um, lived its its full natural life until we moved. And what, what actually happened was um, the city, because, you know, we really stood our ground, <laughs> uh, actually changed their, their street permit policy altogether. So one of the reasons why the city of Seattle now has a play street uh, permit where uh, folks can can petition, not, not petition, can just request to the city that they they have a that that a permit that they can get a permit to close the street for an event for for a play party uh, for zero dollars is because of the sandbox because ultimately what the sandbox uh, issue was bringing to to the to the fore was well we give a free street use permit to somebody who wants to garden and plant in front of their house and that's usually going to be an adult but we say that the same exact space the same exact dimensions are a prohibited street use because children are going to use it so essentially I said to them show me another uh, part of your street use policy where you change how much you charge, you change your policy based on who's using or who's requesting the use. 
and that I think really, you know, very well intentioned people, an incredible team at, at the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, they just met a case that really called into question the fundamental fairness of uh, a program that they had for a long time, right? And 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 to their credit, they changed it. They they expanded it. They they created much more opportunity for people to use for many more kinds of people to use streets in different ways because of that. Um, and then I became um, I became their colleague, and uh, and that was uh, that was an incredible experience, and I was happy to work with all of those folks. Um, but that's not why you invited me to talk to you today. So uh, I have the pleasure, the, just the absolute honor to, to work with an organization in, in that, that is called Front and Centered. And we are a coalition of community groups for and by and led by uh, people of color all across the state, and we have more than 70 organizations that, and, and all kinds of different organizations, uh, brand new ones uh, that are joining, uh, ones that have been with us for, for many, many years, uh, the various NAACP chapters, uh, an amazing organization um, in, in Yakima Valley, the, the Asian American Pacific Islander Coalition, in, in, in not the Yakima Valley, uh, just in, in Yakima, and uh, just just tons and tons of organizations. Entre Hermanos in, in, in Seattle, um, Duwamish uh, River Cleanup Coalition. And what we do is we work to amplify their voices in this, the, the environmental justice space. And what what I hope that we can do together here um, is that I can um, I can speak to you a little bit about the the intersection of environmental justice and transportation policy, and and hopefully get you uh, to see if you haven't already. You know that that this this is not a question of a Venn diagram. This is a, an absolute oval where the two things coincide almost 100% that the, uh, well, and, and then uh, hopefully I can close out with a call to action and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then we can have a discussion. So I, I wanna start sharing my screen, but I really don't wanna be tied to these slides so much because I, I like words and I wanna, I wanna speak some words to you and then share some words <laughs> and uh, but I, I i so i want to start by saying well you know what is environmental justice and i think that that in in the most simplest way the way that we think about environmental justice at at front and centered is that and the, it's 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 in the name of the organization it, it means that the, the people that are on the front lines that are bearing the, 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 the brunt of the impacts of the ways that we run our society have a voice and are front and centered in making sure that we find ways to, to solve that and to reduce that, those burdens and to reduce the, the unfair cost that communities of color and that poor communities have borne for the way that, that we've run our, our societies for however long. So embedded in that idea, fundamental to that idea is just basic democracy. That, that having a voice in, in how society is organized, having a voice in, in how we uh, you know, in, invest and in how we clean up the the uh, the impacts of the past and how we make things more fair is the fundamental work that that uh, environmental justice is is seeking to accomplish. And I I guess what I you know and there's there's environmental justice and and I think that to our mind environmental justice is the big tent. 
and climate justice is one of the elements within the big tent. And that's a sort of an important distinction. And so what I, what I hope to be able to draw out for you today is that, uh, that obviously, you know, we all, we, we as a, a, a whole species, all of us need to figure out how we're going to decarbonize our economies and decarbonize our societies. The, the work that we're doing is illuminating, we hope that environmental justice and climate justice is not a detour from that journey, is not a, a, a cul-de-sac on how we decarbonize, but it is the shortest way to do it. What, what, what the, the fundamental principle that, 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 that guides our work is this idea that the climate crisis is fundamentally possible because we have a system in which certain people are assigned more value than others. And therefore, we've been able to pollute to the levels that we have, right? So what, what we are working to do is to say, our process, our, 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 our journey to get to a carbon-free economy, to a carbon-free society goes through environmental justice, that the way to get there is environmental justice. And I have a really clear sort of set of uh, kind of policies that illuminate that. And that uh, I promise you, and Micah was, was uh, giving me snaps when I said this, that uh, it, this will end in a, a, a call to action, <laughs> hopefully. So <laughs> um, I wanna, so I, I wanna start by saying that, um, you know, the, the interconnected nature of these things should be, uh, whoa, things just, just shifted here. Uh, can you see my screen, Brock? Yes, we can see your screen and you might want to hit the present button on the- Oh, good, okay, yeah. so that's good. So, so the, we are, we are calling this campaign the Just Transition Campaign. And, uh, and that, that we're borrowing that from kind of the approach that front and center takes as a whole that, that I just kind of got through in way, maybe way too many words kind of not summarizing, which is the idea <laughs> that, that, for our, that the, the transition away from fossil fuels must be a transition away from, uh, from racism and structural inequalities because it's the shortest way to get there. And I, I, I'll talk more about that in, in, term, in the context of specific policies. But so, you know, in, in, in when it comes to transportation, we have a, a fundamentally unbalanced system that, that uh, doesn't serve anybody particularly well, but has tremendous impacts in terms of the auto dependency that it causes. That, that the, the impacts of the, the, the fact that in order to participate, we built a built environment and a society in which to participate, the price of admission is kind of having to own and operate and insure an automobile, right? And, and I'm sure that Brock and, and many of the, the transit advocates in, in the call have had this experience where people come to you and they say, well, I can get to my job by transit, but I can't come home because it just ends too soon, right? So that, that, is, that is just just fundamentally leaving so many people or curtailing the participation of so many people in society because we don't, we don't have a robust way to get people to work and back because that, that, that the, of the, all of the underlying assumptions of how we fund transit systems for how, who we say is important. So in this discussion, there's really four numbers that we think 
tell the story and that when we speak to our legislators, and we have had many, many conversations in the last few weeks and months uh, to, with our legislators who are, uh, you guys, to be honest, who are right now meeting in secret to discuss a potential run at another transportation package that very likely will be done in what can only be called the shadow legislative process, which is called assembly days, right? It's so last year we had 110 days to discuss a, a statewide transportation pro pro uh, package that was gonna, uh, you know, tie us into an enormous uh, portfolio of road widening and, and highway construction that I'll talk about in a bit is something that we want to address really head on, but, but, uh, and, and, you know, and it was still terrible in terms of democracy, just terrible, right? Where, where the transportation committee released this 16 year, $15 billion package at 9 PM. And then said in the next, it said, come to testimony the next day, we'll give you 30 seconds. Right, so already there, we're, we're, we're like in this incredible deficit of democracy. What's happening this year should give us pause and should really, really worry us because the uh, Democrats in the House, Democrats in the Senate are trying to come to a consensus agreement that they're hoping that they're gonna pass in this shadow uh, assembly day, which is five days. And they've told us they're not going to hear any testimony. So, yeah, that's that's part of the call to action. So hold that. So hold that thought in in your mind. So four numbers that that really tell the story and that are different, and that really should focus our minds in the difference between our discussion with legislators, our discussion with our members and with regular people that, that, that care about uh, transportation, that care about justice between this year and last year. This hasn't changed. 45% of our emissions in, in the state of Washington come from the transportation sector. Not disconnectedly, we have one of the highest rates of asthma across the country. Right, those two things are really closely linked. Uh, front and Center uh, is doing amazing work that I have nothing to do with, but I, I'm a, an incredible fan of. Uh, that's a pollution prevention work group that, that is partnering with the University of Washington to create tools where we can understand the environmental health disparities of different geographies and different communities in the state. So. Mini call to action number one is uh, Google Washington State Environmental Health Disparities Map. An amazing tool was developed in part by Front and Center. is now part of uh, what the what the um, the depart how the Department of Health uh, looks at environmental health impacts in different places. So, fully and and. The work that we do in, in front and center is often in partnership with an amazing organization who you should follow and learn uh, if you don't uh, learn more about what they do called Disability Rights Washington. They are incredible. And so they, they have done this work to actually go through the numbers of people that are licensed to have a car in Washington state and the numbers of people who live in Washington state. And it turns out that a full quarter of us don't have a driver's license and many more people might have a driver's license, don't have a car, right? And why is that? Well, it's because a lot of people are just too poor to pay the $10,000 a year to own, operate, and insure a car. A lot of people are disabled and can't drive. A lot of people are just too young and can't drive. Some people are just too old and can't drive. And yet, when you look at the transportation proposals that, that both the House and the Senate put out last year for how we were gonna allocate funds, 
97% of those dollars went to explicitly auto-centric, auto-specific projects. So if you recall the very first image that I showed, that teeter-totter where you know it's absolutely, the, the car is on one side and is weighing down everybody, this isn't a question of you know, preference or a question of, of the, how much space in the culture we give to cars. It's just a function that we just put that much more money into infrastructure and programs and attention to programs and, and infrastructure that supports cars. So the heat dome. So this event happened less than three months ago, right? And the, the epidemiology and, and the, uh, the, the researchers are, are coming back now and said, hey, you know, that those three days in Oregon, in Washington, in British Columbia killed 1,200 people, right? They killed 1,200 people. The, the, the phrase that we like to say is that communities of color were hit first and worst, but all of us suffered, right? And these are inseparable from those two things, those two numbers that I shared with you at the beginning, that 45% of our emissions are coming from surface transportation and that 97% of our dollars are not going to mitigate those emissions, are going to be spent in ways that exacerbate those emissions. So um, I already said this, look at that. Um, so the idea is that for us to be able to address our transportation impacts as they relate to environmental justice, or, 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 or let me say, as they relate to the climate in Washington state, we have to address our disparities in just basic justice in terms of the way that we are approaching our transportation policy, the way that our, our systems are run, and who we say is important and not important. In, in our decisions. So um, I, the, the work that we're doing this year at Front and Center really has kind of three pillars. What we're saying is, is, hey, you know, so much of this conversation about transportation gets so like either incredibly arcane in terms of, oh, you know, and on purpose, you know, my dad's an engineer, but I'm about to trash engineers here, that, that the conversation on purpose is designed to keep people out. And so we say, oh, the experts are gonna figure out. Or we're dealing, uh-oh, dog is barking, sorry about that. Or we're dealing with such enormous numbers that, that, that it's difficult to figure out what's going on. So that we really wanna come back to the, the sort of fundamental principles of basic rights. You know, what are basic rights? Basic rights are things that you don't put up for a, a vote. It's not whether you're popular or not popular or what you're saying is, is respected or not respected. You have the right to free speech, right? It's not, it's not up for negotiation. It just is. And Transportation is something that it, it, it has such a tremendous impact in every one of our lives that we really need to be able to bring this to fundamental, to a question of fundamental rights. And I'm gonna share with you the work that we've did around with our members around mobility rights, transportation rights. And then we're thinking we're missing basic tools, right? So at, our observation of the way that decisions are being made in Olympia about transportation is that it's a four letter word that is uh, animating the vast majority of decisions. And that word is pork. It's whether, whether members in particular districts have big projects in their district or not, is essentially what, what carries the day in the vast majority of decisions. It's not policy, 
It's not fundamental rights. It's not even performance, right? And I'll, I'll, I, can, I can talk about that in, in, in a little bit, but fundamentally what we're saying is that we're making decisions that affect the largest slice of our carbon emissions without any sense of how they will impact future emissions. I can guarantee you, if you go to your legislator and you ask her or you ask him, this particular roadway project, this particular highway expansion project that you're championing, what is the climate impact of that project? They will tell you, I have no idea because we have never done that work. So this year, we are front and center are partnering with the Rocky Mountain Institute who has been doing amazing research in the past year to develop a calculator where you, Jennifer, can go and say, oh, hey, this project that means to add 14 lane miles to this particular highway will have this additional impact in terms of emissions of climate changing gases, but also emissions that impact people's health. And we should contend with that. We should grapple with that, right? So uh, that's something that we're rolling out later this year and we're really excited about because, I mean, I hate to use this word, but it's just insane to be making decisions at, at the 16 year uh, uh, level which are gonna cause emissions for the next 50 or 60 years without having any sense or even have to have an explanation for what's, what the impact of those decisions are. So then the next thing is called a people's transportation package. So you know we're really intentionally saying a people's transportation package because the name of or our organization is front and centered. We wanna put people front and centered. And so, Today, I'm gonna to give you a uh, little, uh, okay, this is really boring. This is really boring too. Okay, hang on just a sec. Let me find the, the, the right. Uh, so I wanna share with you, uh, oh, I stopped presenting. Let me, let me go back um, and, okay. So when we say, this idea of just basic rights. Basic rights are rights that everybody should have. Doesn't matter if you're young or old or black or white or Hispanic, where you live, we need to protect these. We need to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that everyone has these. So we start by saying, uh, that nobody should die or be injured traveling on our roads and streets and sidewalks. That should be the starting point. Now, each one of these can have a huge body of work related to it, but I do wanna you know, underline that all of this is possible. And we have examples of how this is done when we put our minds to it. And our, our, our closest corollary to this is air transportation. Air transportation was many, 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 many more times more dangerous than it is today. And what did they do? They said, we don't think this is acceptable for this many people to die traveling in our industry. In transportation, every day, every, every day we say in our work, all of us here that work in this, We've priced in the 30,000 people that are going to die in our roads this year. That is just an assumption of the way that we do business, and that has to stop. So the other one is, and, and again, I told you from the beginning, this is, this, is, this is just regular, basic, everyday things. It's, we're never going to get into level of service or all that BS here. But it's, not, it's not an engineering exercise. There is, and these, these, this is not to say this is not quantifiable, but every single household should be able to go and get the fresh fruits and vegetables that they need 
within 20, min within 20 minutes, even without a car. Right, so what does that mean? That means that the intersection of, of transportation and land use is something that we need to take seriously. That means that we need to take seriously the, the interconnectivity of our, of, our, of our sidewalks and our bikeways and our transit system. We say that nobody should be harmed by pollution or noise from transportation. And this is, I, I promise I'm, I'm winding up to the, the call to action. So uh, hold that thought. Uh, we have the right to transportation that keeps us safer from climate, from the climate crisis and doesn't hurt future generations. That every trip, regardless of whether, where you are uh, in, in the state, that are a mile or less, and I know this is tricky because this essentially means every trip, but should be enjoyable, should be done with dignity, even if you're doing it without a car. Here's a, a, a little sort of exercise for that, that everybody can do is go to open up Google Maps, try to find two places in Washington state that you cannot drive to spend four or five minutes. We have done an amazing job of making this state absolutely accessible to making almost every car trip a dignified excursion, a safe, predictable thing. Now try to find any five mile trip from your house that you would be willing to do by foot any three mile trip that you would be willing to do by foot. That's a fundamental failure of priorities and we can change that. That's the part of this work that makes me fundamentally optimistic is that all of us here, all of us over at, at WashDOT, amazing professionals at WashDOT, everybody in Olympia, even the Republicans, we have the tools today to make sure that everybody is able to enjoy these fundamental transportation rights. We have all of the tools today that, that are needed for us to, to decarbonize our transportation and get to, to a place of justice. We just have to apply them, right? So, no household spends more than 45% of its income on transportation and energy. Every, ooh, every child who wants to can walk, bike, or roll safely to school. When we say roll, that's use a wheelchair, use an assistive device. So this is a, a, a key principle because, and, now, and all of these are, because if we take care of the most vulnerable users of our network, we by default take care of everybody. So in engineering, we, we although I'm not an engineer, uh, use this idea of a design vehicle. This road is designed for a 18 wheeler. What we're proposing here is that the design vehicle that should be the, the, the one that we always check to make sure we've served her need is a nine-year-old girl who wants to bike to her school, is a nine-year-old boy, 11-year-old boy who uses a wheelchair who wants to be able to go and buy some candy at the store. We have all of the tools to make sure that that trip is just as safe, just as reliable, just as, as predictable as any of us who might get into our SUVs and go to Target. That trip is no less important than any of our car trips that we take. So transit, like I said before, needs to be frequent, needs to span the day at night so people can go to work and come back. And then fundamentally, the pursuit of happiness shouldn't depend on you being able to have a car and, and operate a car. And, and insure a car and drive a car, right? 
This, is, this needs to be the starting point of how we make our decisions. And then we need the tools to see, well, uh, you know, legislator X in your district, how well are you doing relative to basic transportation rights and hold them accountable. So I wanna stop the slideshow here. And then I wanna just kind of give you a sense of where we see that intersection of environmental justice and transportation justice and, and climate justice in a, a, a very specific policy. And then I wanna end with my call to action. So last year, the, the legislator, legislature passed a, a cap and trade bill for the state of Washington. And uh, very well-intentioned, uh, not a good policy in, in our minds. And I'll tell you why in a second that front and center was very much against it. When I said at the very beginning that the, the, the kind of environmental impacts we're seeing at the global scale are being felt first and worst by communities of color, that's, that's particularly true when it comes to local level pollution that are the criteria pollutants that are really, really closely linked to greenhouse gases, right? The, the, the particulate emissions, the NOx, the SOx, the, the, the other uh, pollutants that hurt people's health today that you will see are primarily concentrated in low income and uh, uh, minority communities in Washington state. When you look at the environmental health disparities map, those two things are inseparable. They're really inseparable. But when, when we're putting out diesel pollution, when we're putting out coal uh, particulates, we're putting out all of those things, we're putting out greenhouse gases and we're hurting people's health in a particular place. The carbon pollution is spread all over the atmosphere, is screwing it with everything that, that, that is happening in our climate. And at the same time, we are hurting particular communities specifically in their health, in their ability to live their full lives today. So we've created a cap and trade program. Essentially what that does is that takes that sacrifice zone that you know the 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 places where it was okay to dump and pollute and hurt those people's health because they didn't have the 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 political clout or the money or because they they you know, because of you know structural racism and and just not having the access to power uh, that that others have had we've said all right that's still a sacrifice zone but now you have to pay to pollute there Right? You have to pay to pollute there and you can use credits by reducing pollution somewhere else to continue to pollute there. In their discussion today about transportation, the House and the Senate are talking about what to do with the money that's coming from the, the Climate Commitment Act or from our cap and trade. And there are many people in that discussion that would like to be able to take the $5 billion a year, who knows how much it's actually gonna be that is coming from this new source and build more highways with it. So that is got to stop. We cannot take carbon money to make more carbon, to take money that essentially is pricing a sacrifice zone to create another sacrifice zone. I can, you know, I'll share these, these stats with Barack so that you can, you can look at them and that uh, black and brown people uh, consume less, produce fewer emissions, but are impacted 56% and 63% more, breathe in more pollution than they create relative to white people. So the idea that we're gonna take money from the cap and trade program and then build highways is the most outrageous thing I have ever heard. And that is squarely in discussion in Olympia right now. And that is my call to action for you is, you know, we don't, 
I don't do hashtags, but it basically, <laughs> it would be uh, no carbon money for highways, right? So that's, that's where I started at the very beginning is, is saying that the, the, the shortest path to a, a post carbon future runs through climate justice. This is an example of that. Right. We have a, a larger and I see you, Victor, I'm going to stop. I promise I'm going to stop talking uh, in, in a second and then we can have a discussion that um, in what what as we're going to we're going to roll our our um, generated uh, carbon uh, calculator with the Rocky Mountain Institute in just a few weeks, our larger ask is do not expand highways. Stop with the, 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 the road building because even at our most aggressive assumptions, who knows if we'll get there, there's all kinds of questions about that, about electrification, we will not meet our, our climate targets without taking a shift towards reducing our reliance on cars. But it starts with stopping this insanity of using money that purportedly came from reducing carbon emissions to build more highways. This is, this is essentially saying, we're gonna, take, we're gonna take carbon tax money and we're gonna build more pipelines with it. So I, I invite you to join us in this effort. Uh, to, to, uh, our, our hope is that more folks that, that we're creating uh, you know, uh, inspiration and raw material that people can adapt and use in their own communities and use in their own campaigns. Uh, and that, that you will make your voices heard even though these decisions are likely gonna be happening in the dark of night during the shadow assembly days. Brock, that's my, that's my spiel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paulo. Um, I do imagine you have sparked uh, a lot of questions and comments and ideas, and I don't want to hold the back. And since Victor has his hand up, I'm just going to uh, turn it over to the crowd here. Um, Victor, go ahead and ask your first question. And everybody else, feel free to um, put your hand up, or if you find that too annoying, you know, just go off of uh, visual mute and uh, We'll queue up for for your question. And and Brock, I'm really bad at like reading and and spouting off at the same time. So people may have asked questions in the chat. So I just want to make sure that somebody is looking at those and can yeah. read them out. No, we're we're good on the chat. Yeah. Uh, Victor, go ahead. Thank you, Brock. Uh, good afternoon, Paulo. Um, I'm going to make three quick comments here, and then I'll get out of the way i've got a whole list more but on your last point there about the carbon tax here in snohomish county we need one more highway we have a transportation route from boeing north on i-5 to highway 2 to the eastern portion of the county there needs to be a highway on the south end of that in order to one reduce the carbon footprint and I can tell you a lot of those people will not give up their cars. And so, you know, reducing their time on the road will still continue to help reduce the carbon footprint. The second thing is on your transportation bill of rights, you spoke of the cost of not being able to afford a car. And I'm not sure I believe all that. What I'm finding more is that people aren't afraid able to afford a license and we have people who are smashing $25,000 cars in e each other at will well, we have a real problem when our fire in the county is responding three times an hour to motor vehicle collision and that's for medical aid that's not the ones that just the police are being called to or just being simply ignored the third point I want to make here real quick 
is that mass transit needs to run on a seven day schedule, whether it's 20 minutes an hour, 30 minutes an hour, but every bus every day at the same time. When a kid cannot go to the library to do his business in a short period of time, and then has 90 minutes to wait for the next bus, there's something wrong. And it goes back to the, if you build it, people will come, but they won't build it. They think the parents to have time on weekends, take their kids to the library, wherever else they wanna go. I'm 60, I have a guide dog. I don't wanna wait around 45 minutes, an hour, when I'm doing 15 minutes of business. The system has to run regularly, daily, in order to reduce, in, to, in order to create that equality. Well, thank you. Lots there, Paulo. Oh, that we could go. I we could go to the next folks. I think. Okay, um, Joe, you're up next. Thanks. You know. Um, Great presentation, Paolo. It's probably no surprise. I'm very happy with it uh, because I, I really am not happy. As an open government guy, I'm not really happy with the legislative process. And and um, hang on. Oh, okay. I had something playing on my browser. I had to turn that off. But you know, one of my main concerns is that you know we're going to have the legislature once again steamroll and mainly highways packets our state ferry system is in crisis and there's no way in hell i'm going to support a transportation package that doesn't take care of our state ferry system um and you know just just how do you think Paolo, at this late stage in the game do we influence this process to get a to get a package that's really pro transit and pro pro ferries um and i'll stop there thanks well, honestly, I think that the the most likely and probably the best outcome is let's hit the pause button. Let no 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 you know sneaking big packages in the middle of the night. Let's stop and have a, a, a big statewide discussion about what's really needed. So Joe, I, I totally agree. This is it's just it's a deficit of democracy to do this in the middle of the night. We shouldn't we shouldn't stand for it. Thank you, because um, I will also add that I hope you're able to give this presentation to Senator Liz Lovelett of the 39th, the 40th district, who I'm sure will be very receptive to your messages, and I'll stop there. Thanks. We've spoken to Senator Lovelett. Micah. Yeah, Micah is speaking, he, him pronouns. Um, I work with Disability Rights Washington, and yeah, love the shout out to Anna earlier. And just wanted to ask like, how, how can we be active? Like not just disability rights, but all of us here as individuals, like how can we um, be advocating for this? Cause I just think about like snow track, right? Snohomish County. Um, I live on 169th uh, right next to the Walmart. And I walk two and a half miles to Aldwood Mall. And even that trip, for a lot of it, I had uh, for about like half a mile, I had sidewalk. And for the rest of it, fast cars going right by me while I'm either in the street or in a ditch. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy I didn't get hit. But I also live on the same intersection that a couple months ago, two people on bikes got hit, one critically injured, one killed. And so it's something where, yeah, like how, how can we be active in this? Um, so, you know, Micah, this, 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 is, a, this is a great question. Uh, two, two things. So, so Anna Zivartz, uh, who runs the Disability Mobility um, uh, uh, Program, well, and is, is got a, an amazing uh, set of actions that, that she's got planned for the next month that uh, it'd be great if folks on the call wanted to find out more about she's she's calling it week without a car and uh she yep. and i think micah you're working on that right yep. totally. and and so micah and anna and others from disability rights washington have asked uh, a bunch of legislators and other leaders to say spend a week without a car and document your experience mm -hmm. and 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 let's talk about it right yeah. so what 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 
the, the, the thing that we really want to make really transparent is that everybody deserves dignity, even if they can't drive, yeah. right? What, what, what Micah is describing there is something that we would never accept for a regular car trip, right? Can you imagine like you're driving along and the road just ends? That's happened, right? Like, you know, I mean, Brock was saying that, you know, I come from Brazil. Yeah, there's places in the third world where it's like the road just ends. And then you're like, I don't know, you have to like deal with the just dirt or push your car or whatever. Yeah. But that's not a dignified way to get around. People with disabilities face this every single day where the sidewalk yeah. just ends. Why, why is that acceptable? Right? And it's, it's only because we have, a, we have a deficit of democracy and we accept less dignity for some people than for others. And we need the way to make your voices heard here is you say, look, there's a fundamental right to transportation and mobility here. And we can do this. We're smart people. We've got all the engineers we need. We have all the money we need. We just need the political will to do it. I a saw Sherman jump on and off of a couple of times. I don't know if you, if Sherman, if you had a question or a comment you wanted to raise. I, I, sorry, yeah, I tried to get on the video and it looked like all weird on the camera angle, oh. so I just leave it off. But um, I thought you looked good. <laughs> it, was, it seemed like it was distorted, so I'm just going to leave it off. Uh, great presentation, Paulo. I appreciate the insight. It's a good uh, perspective on these in, um, issues and. As a city of Bothell transportation planner is where I am. I am uh, working on our bike plan and trying to make those improvements to, you know, uh, provide an alternative means of travel besides a car. Uh, again, I guess the good, I guess the comment only had is like to make it safer, to make the whole system safer. As you said, your analogy to the to airfare and air to or air air travel is the amount of users and licensed operators compared to licensed pilots that get us around safely and and all that air travel you know um uh, really tough to make that comparison i think because we're al allowing people to drive that maybe shouldn't be driving or impaired or whatever you know which is a, a big cause of the safety issues we have in the transportation system even though you know as an engineer personally myself you know we've tried to design for a safe system and, you know, as much as possible. So, but um, again, I just wanted to, I just appreciate your comments uh, working on, you know, I don't, we, we have one more section of, of roadway that we have to widen um, in the city. Other than that, we're not, don't see anything further coming along, but the purpose of widening that section of roadway is to get, is so that we can get a uh, rapid transit down it Otherwise, they won't go down a single lane roadway highway because they can't if they get stuck in traffic, they can't, you know, maneuver. So we'll take we'll t we'll do we'll do that project and, you know, so we can get the mass transit and make that shift. Thank you yeah, for those, your presentation. Those are all really great points, Sherman. And, and uh, there the debate between user error and engineering failure is a really interesting one. And what I would what I would ask folks to do is to take a look at the, the report that Transportation for America and Smart Growth uh, America put out uh, just recently called uh, Dangerous by Design. And it, it really calls into question, you know, the, 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 the designs principles that we're using. Anyways, I really appreciate you, Sherman, and I, you know, good luck with all of the work. And I really appreciate the, the, the work that, that you're doing in the, the Bothell bike plan. We need more and more and more of you. Thank you. Hillary? Yeah, I, I think Eldon had their hand up before me if they want to go. So, uh, yeah, sure. I can, I can go first. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for this, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, so one thing that came to mind, so in the recent news, there, that kind of applies to, I guess, also the transportation aspect. Um, in the recent news, there was EPA had uh, sent out a new study that would allow kind of higher levels of pollutants 
uh, in the uh, Duwamish River Valley, and which could potentially roll back uh, a lot of the cleanup. And I just wondered, like, how do we make sure that despite um, like federal or state policies or proposals, how do we make sure that we can accomplish what we want despite these proposals kind of uh, potentially rolling back uh, what we want to accomplish? That is such a good question. Um, so, so Duwamish uh, River Cleanup Coalition and Transportation, uh, or, or sorry, and and uh, Front and Center are are both, you know, working very hard on that. Uh, primarily DRCC because that's that's their their community. But I, I don't know. I think ultimately, I guess it comes down to making sure that we have a voice and we have political power. Uh, because that that's so disappointing that essentially they they the little that I understand of that issue is that that this policy came out saying well <laughs> they just moved the goalpost a lot closer the 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 they said you know the cleanup will be accomplished when uh, a much higher level of uh, and, and and a much higher level of pollutants is acceptable and we can call that cleaned up. Uh, Hillary? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a Snohomish County planner for some context, but I was curious if you've run across any states that have legislation or processes for transportation that we could model it after or that have a good example of what we might want to look at. Ah, so so that's such a good point. And, and uh, Boy, I, I really appreciate that that question because we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the the Pittsburgh uh, Department of Infrastructure and Mobility, or they have a kind of a funky name, because the a lot of our principles, the, a lot of their principles for mobility are what we worked with our community on to create the the Transportation Bill of Rights. So uh, I. I would start there because they Pittsburgh has essentially taken something very similar to this idea of fundamental rights in in mobility, and and kind of incorporated those into the way that their agency, into the very sort of foundation of that that agency. So they must be doing something right. Um, I also really like to look at different industries. You know, I think it's really, it would be really interesting for us. And I, you know, Sherman, I totally appreciate your point, you know, licensed pilots, but you know, air travel was a lot worse before they got pilots and the, the, the manufacturers and the FAA together at the same table and said, okay, guys and gals, no harm, no foul. Let's actually work together to make the system safer instead of pointing fingers. So healthcare is doing something quite similar too, right? Because healthcare is just incredibly dangerous, right? Like I used to work at a hospital and seriously, the president of the hospital would say, this is a dangerous thing that we're doing. If you ever wake up, find yourself in a hospital one day, get out as fast as you can because bad things happen in hospitals. People get infections, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not to say that, you know, Obviously, I, I, you know, the, the healthcare folks are doing the, their best to make it safer. And it's interesting to figure out what are the, what are the steps that they're doing with that. Um, I don't know. I guess what I would say, Hillary, is, is the, the, the people that really give me inspiration are, are the advocates. And, you know, I would start with Disability Rights Washington, but I also take a look at all of the stuff that Transportation for America is doing, because they are doing amazing, amazing things. Yeah, thank you so much. And I really appreciate all the comments that I'm hearing and your presentation. I was just like snapping my fingers the entire time. <laughs> thank oh, you okay. for having this. Um, Tom Hinkson, was, uh, who's the director of Ever Transit. Um, Tom, on video. And it, Tom, if you have a quick question, let me know. Um, we are a little bit over, but I do, if you have a question, I definitely want to get to it, Tom. And sometimes he's in multiple meetings at once, so that might be happening right now. Hmm. Well, let's, um, let's go to Christine. 
Christine has their hand up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paolo. Um, I was fascinated and overwhelmed by your presentation. And I just wanted to ask you two things. First of all, it sounds like transportation is a piece of this environmental justice. And it almost sounds like it's going to require how we reorganize the neighborhoods we live in as well as the transportation. And then also, could you possibly run for president? I couldn't because I was born in Brazil. Um, so, so that's an easy no to that question. Um, the, I think you're, you're totally right that, that we, like I, like, I, like I keep saying, I think that technically we, we have Sherman, we have, we have the engineers that we need, we have Hillary, we have the planners that we need, you know, we have Micah, the advocates that we need, and now we need to get more people on board so that they can see this is not taking anything away from anybody. This is just making sure that everybody has dignity when they walk out their door and they need to go about their business. Blind people for the wins, says Micah. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's so often the, the reason why these things can happen is because we don't speak up. And, and, the, and then this space is taken up by the quote unquote experts. But you know what, the experts that they, they, they need to, and they want to in, in many regards do the right thing, but we haven't put the pressure so that they, they have to, so that they, they you know, like, like Eldon said, you know, man, this is, this is a, a cleanup effort for a Superfund site that's been going on for 20 years. And then at the last moment, you, you get this, this sort of chair pulled out from under you and saying, hey, it's actually, we don't, we don't need to clean it up that hard anymore, right? So it takes, it takes a, a constant effort, but I really, uh, I don't know. I, I'm inspired by all the people that I'm working with, by all the people that, that come out to hear these talks. By, I, and I honestly feel like we, we don't, we're not really missing anything but the will. We we can do this, you know, and and it's it's that we have and we have people in the right places. Roger Millar is actually one of the most progressive secretaries of transportation that we have in this country, but our our political process is let's just be honest, it's broken, right? These these folks they're going to make these decisions that are going to have an enormous impact for decades to come in secret over five days, starting November 5th. So that's our first call to action is to say, you know, no, no secret highways and no carbon money for highways. That's really simple. And we can organize around that and just, just tell there's, look, you guys, it's a toxic work environment up there in Olympia. It's including for the Democrats, right? Like we've talked to so many people who say, I, I really want to come out on the right side of this issue, but I'm going to get torpedoed if I don't vote for this package. What we need to do is to give those people the courage and the support to find their voice and say, this is not right. So everything that we're doing right now is organized around trying to help those progressive Democrats to find their courage and we need to defend them, right? And to and to to be able to have their back when they're going to do something difficult, because it's it's all about from what I'm hearing. I've never you know, it's like exactly, Emily Emily Wicks is a great legislator, and and when we and she is she's so smart and she's thinking about this exactly in the right way, but she needs our help to be able to take take the tough calls on these issues, right? When, when, so when you call her office and you say no, no carbon money for highways, when you say no secret highways in the dead of night, then she needs to know that other people have her back. And that's why, that's, that's why you're making these calls, right? Because you guys, it's, it's hard. It's the, 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 the sense that I'm getting, it's that nasty place to be. And we gotta, we gotta, 
give them support and give them the, the, the progressive Democrats. We had, we had a great conversation with, with uh, David Hackney from, from the 11th. And he said, I want, I want to make environmental justice my brand. You know, we like that. But at the same time, he said, I don't want to take any symbolic votes. So those two things don't really square, right? We need to give him the courage to take the symbolic votes. Hopefully, it won't take that many symbolic votes to stop this, this bad package because the, the Republicans are not with us. But, you know, whew, I'm running out of steam. Brock, uh, wind us down. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're past our time here. I want to thank you, Paulo. This has been a really great conversation. Um, great presentation, great Q&A. Uh, thank you for the work that you do at Front and Centered and, and all aspects of, of your work in life. Um, I, I will double down on the call to action to some extent, which is that, you know, um, we could have the best professionals at WashDOT and we do in many ways um, or within our cities and we do in many, or counties and we do in our many ways. Um, but the state package uh, is what dictates what they built. Um, there's a project list. That project list is, is something they have to deliver on regardless of what internal uh, policies they have, processes, uh, design manuals. Um, if it's in the project list, they have to build it and they're, they're kind of stuck to it. And so it is important that um, we get the right project list uh, at the end of the day. And um, so being engaged at that level is very important. Um, also, I just came out of this morning's meeting with the PSRC uh, uh, prioritization uh, evaluation committee, and they're wrestling with the issue of like, how many points do we give to safety uh, within our evaluation? How many points do we give to equity? And at one point, I, they were starting to pit the two against each other. I um, know. Uh. And so, you know, these are just things that you, we have to continue to, to work on. Uh, and improve both the evaluation side uh, as funding lists are coming together, as well as you know state packages. Um, so that's a call right. to action. You know, uh, uh, plug in with groups like Front and Centered and Disability Rights Washington who do the advocacy in Olympia um, and make these things happen. Thank so. you, everybody, and um, you can get in touch with me via Brock. You can share my email, and I'm I really, really, really look forward to working with you all. In these next few months to make sure that we don't commit climate justice atrocities in, in the in the dead of night. All right, thanks, thanks, Paulo. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Our next, uh, we don't have our next uh, speaker forum yet scheduled, but we will have one uh, at the end of October. So I will see everybody then. Thank you. Thanks, Paulo. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.